Please remember the world that you are now seeing, for this natural world is in jeopardy. And even if you are willing to help put an end to what you are about to see, you may never be able to see the world in the same way again. In the early part of 1999, an immense operation began, an operation using aircraft that many of us will find difficult to accept. This operation involves a dispersal of massive amounts of fine materials into the atmosphere, and the implications of these actions are grave and far-reaching, and they strain the limits of understanding. There will be counterclaims to the evidence that is presented within this film, and you will be told that all is normal and as it should be. You will be told that there is nothing to be concerned about and that all is as it has always been. Your eyewitness accounts will be dismissed as unreliable. This dismissal by claimed authorities and officials will be in direct contradiction to fundamental physical principles and your own common sense, but you will encounter it nonetheless. This dismissal now spans a time period of more than five years, and it accompanies a grassroots awareness that has been reached by millions of concerned and engaged citizens. From this point on, I urge you to use your own mind to reach your own conclusions on the truth of the matter. What you are seeing now is quite normal. These contrails are the trademark of high altitude aircraft since the close of World War II. You notice that the condensation disappears fairly quickly, much like your breath on a cold winter day. This is as it should be, and as it has been. For those curious enough to delve into the physics, chemistry, and thermodynamics of contrails, this normalcy has a more thorough explanation. Yes, science and common sense do agree, and the balances of nature are achieved with this common phenomenon. Now we must take a different turn, a turn to explore an unusual world that now surrounds us and yet a world that many of us remain unaware of. The atmosphere of this planet has been changed and you are now being introduced to one of the main causes of that change. The aircraft at the upper portion of the screen is leaving a normal contrail and it vanishes as any trail of water vapor is expected to but beneath it you see an aircraft emission that is stationary, thick, continuous, and persistent, and it must eventually be concluded that it is not primarily water vapor. The environmental conditions for each trail are not exceptionally different from one another, and yet the result and impact from each trail is entirely different. The only logical way this can occur is if the trails themselves are very different from one another, and indeed they are. The majority of the footage that you are now seeing has been filmed in the high desert regions of New Mexico. This is an arid environment with 
very low humidity levels. It is, in fact, a classic region for conventional contrail formation. Contrails themselves can and do form easily in a low humidity environment. In the past, the passing of a short-lived contrail in the high, clear desert sky was an innocuous and frequent occurrence. Cold and dry conditions, exactly those conditions that are normally found in the upper atmosphere, are extremely favorable to contrail formation. The humidity levels of the upper atmosphere are actually relatively low and is one of the very reasons that most clouds occur in the middle of the troposphere, being the lower portion of our atmosphere up to an altitude of approximately seven miles or so. As this examination of our atmosphere continues, we will be now required to consider four types of events or phenomena. In addition to the customary existence of clouds and contrails, we must now consider a new entry, that of the aerosol. An aerosol is a solid particle in suspension, either in a liquid or a gas, and in this case we are considering the atmosphere as the gas to study. The aerosols will manifest in two primary forms, as an aerosol emission from aircraft and as an aggregate or collection of aerosols in the atmosphere. A suitable term for this collection of aerosols is an aerosol bank. It is known now that the persistent trails that form the subject of this film are primarily solid in nature and origin, and that they are not predominantly water vapor. A brief explanation of cloud formation will help us to understand why this is so. Clouds, that is, normal clouds, require two fundamental elements to form, particles and moisture. Clouds are not suited to form in especially clean air. They require particulate matter, called condensation nuclei, that act as a base for water vapor to adhere to. The size of these nuclei, for the process to be effective, must be extremely small. The size of these nuclei are on the order of sub-micron. For comparison, a human hair is 60 to 100 microns thick, and an asbestos fiber is a couple of microns in thickness. The other essential component for normal clouds to form is a minimum level of humidity. From numerous sources this minimum is on the order of 70 percent relative humidity. Notice that the requirements for cloud formation and contrail formation are already entirely different from one another. This is because they are entirely different phenomena based upon entirely different physical principles. Contrails can and should form readily in clean, cold, and dry air. Normal clouds, on the other hand, require higher moisture levels and a particulate or aerosol base from which to develop. The radical transformation of our sky as a direct result of aircraft activity now forces us to address an entirely new set of conditions. Aircraft are now repeatedly dispersing materials into the upper atmosphere at flight altitude, roughly from 35,000 to 40,000 feet. These materials expand rather than evaporate, and they usually transform into an unsightful haze that over the recent years has decreased our general visibility down to ground levels. One of the remarkable facts is that this commonly now occurs at very low levels of relative humidity on the order of 30 to 40 percent, instead of the 70 percent or greater that is associated with cloud formation. And so we know now that these are not clouds in any conventional sense. They are indeed a unique and artificial creation that now crosses new thresholds in the atmospheric and geophysical sciences. There is one way that such a transformation can be made that is with the introduction of vast quantities of an extremely small, water-loving metallic salt at flight altitude. This transformation cannot be achieved with water vapor alone, and the emissions under examination are indeed not water vapor. They are solid, and they are well entrenched into your air supply. These important conclusions are at the very heart of the aerosol operations that are being disclosed here. 
these changes in the very atmosphere that we breathe have a fundamental impact upon the life of this planet and these aerosol operations have many potential applications that reduce the sanctity of that life these operations are being conducted they are being conducted without your participation or your informed consent they are affecting your life the lives of those you know and love and the very life of the planet itself Try to remember the color blue, for once it was yours to see. The blue sky is your birthright and a source for joy, and it remains at the very core of our existence. There are factual reasons for the blue color of the sky, which can certainly be traced to the cleanliness and clarity of the air that you breathe. But please do not lose the wonder of the sky itself, the magic and emotions that you have once shared with the earth in all of its glory. These are more than facts, reasons, and observations. They are the experiences and memories of life itself. You can no longer see blue now, at least not in the same way that many of us know and remember. Your horizon has largely turned to white, and there is a very good reason that this is so. These fine solid materials, or aerosols, are now in your way, and you will see clearly no more. The source and origin of these aerosols is now abundantly clear and the aircraft operations have now made their mark upon this planet. It is a mark that you must now live with, and that you must now breathe, and that you must bear the consequences of. That is, unless we all become aware of the level of damage that has already been done, and unless we act together to reclaim our planet and its atmosphere. These images were taken in what was once one of the cleanest locations on the earth, and that is the high desert of the southwest. You may now see for yourself the daily reality of your existence, and it is a sad change that we have allowed to occur. Please. Remember the color blue. In the early part of 1999, 
a website under the name of www.carnicum.com was created to call attention to the unusual events and effects surrounding aircraft activity over the southwestern desert skies of the United States. The developer of that site was a generally quiet and conservative former federal employee with no political or environmental notoriety. Within a matter of days, it was apparent that this site was immediately drawing attention from a broad host of high-level government and military agencies, defense contractors, research organizations, chemical and pharmaceutical companies, and health organizations. This interest was documented on this same site for a period of several months, by which time an obvious pattern of monitoring the developing research was apparent. Over the next few years, a glaring disparity had evolved. On one hand, a high level of monitoring of documentation, sampling methods, research, analysis, and disclosure efforts was now documented. On the other, a campaign of continuous dismissal of the significance of the issue and a refusal to investigate was conducted by those very same visitors. You are now seeing a small sample of these frequent visitors and monitoring agencies and companies, such as the Pentagon, multiple Air Force bases, the United States Senate, aircraft manufacturers, pharmaceutical and drug companies, national security, intelligence and emergency agencies, weapon and defense system contractors, research organizations, and the media. The United States Air Force is now on public record as declaring that the entire subject of this documentary is a hoax. This assertion was first made by Lieutenant Colonel Michael K. Gibson in August of 2000 when he stated that, quote, the chemtrail hoax has been investigated and refuted by many established and accredited universities, scientific organizations, and major media publications, end quote. This assertion was later escalated when Colonel Walter M. Washabaugh in 2001 repeated verbatim the previous declaration. Colonel Washabaugh also did not opt to provide the detailed list of the refuting parties. Charles H. Taylor, North Carolina, from the House of Representatives, has stated in March of 2000, in a response to constituent concern, that he has been, quote, informed by the Air Force that these chemtrails are nothing more than ordinary contrails, unquote. He also states that they pose no environmental hazard or risk to human health, and that we can be assured that he will continue to monitor this issue. Harold Heilsness, from the Office of Secretary of Defense, and in response to a direct inquiry to former President of the United States, William Jefferson Clinton, in January of 2000 states that he is familiar with some of the reports on this issue, but that he finds them unsubstantiated by the facts. In addition, assurance is offered that there is certainly no cause for alarm. In the first of many responses from the United States Environmental Protection Agency, under the directive of Carol M. Browner, Administrator, it is acknowledged in December of 1999 that citizen concern is focused on whether or not aircraft may be involved in operations that release chemical or biological substances. The EPA responds that they are, quote, unaware, unquote, of any such applications by such aircraft. In January of 2000, a certified letter including a physical sample of highly unusual airborne fibrous material is sent to Carol M. Browner with a request for identification of the material on behalf of the public environmental and health interest. The EPA responds again in February of 2000 in two separate letters with the statement that they are, quote, unaware, unquote, of any programs to disperse materials into the atmosphere using aircraft. The EPA does not acknowledge the receipt of or the existence of physical materials within the correspondence. In October of 2000, a series of more than 1,000 petition letters of concern was sent to Carol Browner as an indication of significant citizen concern on the aerosol issue. The EPA responded once again in December of 2000 that they continue to remain, quote, unaware, unquote, 
of any aerial application of chemical or biological substances that may have an adverse effect upon the population. After a period of approximately six months, the EPA continues to take no action regarding the identification of the physical sample under their custody, and no acknowledgment of the receipt of that sample is made. The discovery of unusual biological components within that sample by independent researchers heightens the concern for identification of that material. In response to an inquiry from Senator Jesse Helms of North Carolina to the Environmental Protection Agency, Region 4, the EPA once again responds with the phrase of choice, that is, the EPA is, quote, not aware, unquote, of any programs to disperse materials on the population using aircraft. The EPA expresses its appreciation over concern about protecting the environment and is hopeful that their reply addresses any concerns. Greenpeace, an international environmental organization, when contacted regarding the aerosol issue, stated in September of 2000 that they are, quote, unable to comment, unquote, and that they do, quote, not have an official position, unquote, on the matter. In a separate correspondence, Greenpeace responded to a citizen that they are concerned about global environmental problems and that they do not have local chapters that can help with this particular situation. In October of 1999, Senator Jeff Bingaman of New Mexico replied to a concerned constituent that the Air Force has assured to him that what is being observed are simply normal aircraft contrails. It is further stated that although there may be the appearance of an aerosol operation, this is not the case. Senator Bingaman also informs the constituent that he will ensure that the Air Force will reassure people about this issue. United States Senator Richard Luger replies to a constituent in July of 2000 that what is being observed is simply a normal contrail as has been seen since the close of World War II. Furthermore, Senator Luger states that the FAA, NOAA, the EPA, and academic professors have examined the claims only to find out that they have been made by disreputable sources and that upon challenge provide no evidence or data. Representative Mike Thompson of California replies in April of 2000 to a concerned individual that what is being reported and observed is simply a normal consequence of aircraft traffic and that there is no environmental hazard or risk to health. The State of New Mexico Environment Department in September of 1999 acknowledges a number of complaints received regarding aircraft activities over the skies of Santa Fe, New Mexico. The Environment Department declares that the quote, data, unquote, does not suggest that any illegal or clandestine activity is occurring. A scientific document that discusses the nature of normal contrail formation is included within the reply to the New Mexico resident. The citizen is advised to keep the department abreast of any concerns. The Attorney General of New Mexico, Patricia Madrid, in November of 1999, also acknowledges multiple inquiries to her office regarding unusual aircraft operations. The Attorney General declares that there is, quote, substantial evidence, unquote, that the activity and contrails are well within the range of normal aerial activity. After issuing this notice, Patricia Madrid declines to respond to two personal visits made to her office by Clifford Carnicum, a concerned citizen, to discuss the aerosol issue. The Ohio Environmental Protection Agency responds to a citizen in November of 1999 by stating that they are, quote, unable to complete an investigation, unquote, and that they do appreciate the concern expressed by the citizen about the environment. The ABC News 2020 investigative journalism staff respond that, quote, unfortunately, unquote, a request for examination of the aerosol issue was not chosen, and that 2020 thanks the citizen for thinking of them and being in touch. And in June of 2001, one and one-half years after the original submission, 
the United States Environmental Protection Agency acknowledge the receipt of the unusual fibrous physical material. This acknowledgement followed a Freedom of Information inquiry on the topic submitted by a citizen. The EPA refused to identify this sample, stating that it, quote, was not the policy of this office of EPA to test or otherwise analyze any unsolicited samples of material or matter. Since the beginning of 1999, a series of more than three dozen scientific, physical, observational, and analytic methods have been used to examine the dramatic alteration of the atmosphere that has taken place. These tests have been conducted with much labor, time, and expense. They have been conducted with very limited resources and equipment, much of it requiring original construction, development, or modification. What follows is a partial presentation of the sampling methods. The diversity and thoroughness of examination is apparent in the work that has now spanned more than five years. The officials and authorities have not attempted to replicate these testing methods, at least not publicly. They have not reacted to the results in any formal fashion and they have not tangibly responded to the many calls for public inquiry and investigation that have been made. The methods and results of all testing procedures are available on the website www.carnicum.com and this research represents a substantial body of information that may be helpful in interpreting the designs and motivations behind the aerosol operations. Essentially, the method is one of reverse engineering for a global covert operation, and there is no limit to the work that remains to be done. These findings conducted for more than five years are offered to the public. These studies begin with an examination of contrails themselves, a very common and ordinary phenomenon involving the freezing of water vapor into ice and their subsequent dissipation through evaporation and mixing. Meteorological studies of contrail formation and cloud formation have been made. Visibility standards and their reduction from a maximum of 40 to 10 miles have been called to attention. A study of pH, or of acid and alkalinity level, of rainfall has been conducted by a network of concerned citizens across the country. Highly unusual statistical results are present in the vast majority of these studies. Telephotos have been captured in the earlier phase of operations that directly show emissions from aircraft that are in complete defiance of any normal contrail formation. These unusual emissions are not a result of environmental conditions. They originate from the aircraft and can be shown in these cases to have no dependence upon even the engines of the aircraft. HEPA, or High Efficiency Particulate Air Filters, have been used in various states to directly filter the outdoor air in repeated tests. Some of the materials found include the repeated presence of unusual filaments, a gel formation, crystals, and powders. Extraordinary levels of particulate materials have been directly observed and recorded using simple methods discovered by citizens across the country. These methods include the corona of the sun and extremely powerful lamps. Caution with the solar method is especially advised. These observations have been taken under the most ideal weather and air quality conditions, and they nevertheless provide alarming and direct evidence of the substantial changes that have occurred in our atmosphere. Rainwater samples have been distilled to concentrate any solid materials or particulates. Metallic-based materials are evident upon observation. Unusual airborne filament samples have been collected from a variety of locations across the nation, as well as the globe. 
These fibers are highly unusual in their properties, and any claims of being simply spider webs cannot be substantiated. Samples of these fibers have been sent directly to the Administrator of the United States Environmental Protection Agency. Subsequent observation of these fibers under the microscope produces disturbing results, including the occurrence of unusual biological components. The United States EPA has refused to identify these fibers. Incredibly high mold counts have been found within repeated outdoor samples that have been taken. This result is in spite of the fact that the tests were conducted in an extremely arid environment in the high southwest of the United States. This arid environment has been further aggravated by extended drought conditions over the past several years, also a topic to be discussed further. It is a fact that particulate matter in the atmosphere acts as a transport mechanism, or delivery system, for other materials, including biological materials that can piggyback onto the solid materials. This is in addition to the health risk, including respiratory illness and increased mortality that result from higher levels of particulate matter in the air. It is also a fact that must be reported, despite the disturbing and alarming implications that unusual and unexpected biological components have been repeatedly identified in a variety of atmospheric samples across a wide geographic area using a variety of techniques. The fibrous material sent to the United States EPA is especially unsettling, as it was later shown to contain biological components under the review of a medical professional. For those who might think that biological aerosols have no precedent, it might be worthwhile to read carefully the documented U.S. Senate hearings held in 1977 entitled Examination of Serious Deficiencies in the Defense Department's Effort to Protect the Human Subjects of Drug Research, along with the contractors that are enumerated within that report. A variety of electromagnetic devices have been developed and used. This investigation has resulted from the plausible hypothesis that the atmosphere has now been modified into what is called a plasma state, or an electrified gas. Testing has produced a variety of indications that this hypothesis is indeed correct, and that the atmosphere is regularly being used for electromagnetic applications. ELF energy is of special concern because of its direct connection to the health aspects of the electromagnetic nature of human beings. Artificial pulse energy appears to now have been detected on a variety of occasions, and evidence indicates that it is now a part of our unseen environment. Electrolysis methods have further confirmed the existence of unexpected ionizing metallic salts within our atmosphere. Radar anomalies also continue to point to the presence of an altered electromagnetic environment. The testing and sampling methods and results that you have just witnessed are necessary due to the abject failure of the public environmental authorities to respond appropriately to the many requests for investigation that have been made by countless citizens. The responses of the so-called officials and authorities has already become painfully apparent. Jets running stuff in the air. I went outside, I looked out, it was in the morning, and lo and behold, there was, you know, what I thought were contrails, a, a numerous jet spraying, probably four or five jets. The contrails were not dissipating, they continued in the air, and I watched, actually, I, I was horrified because I'd never seen anything like this before, as it continued all day long. And the result was, within a couple hours, the entire sky 
was totally blotted out with this messy white haze. I started documenting after I discovered that nobody was paying attention and that even people who would look up and acknowledge that they see the same thing, they weren't at all concerned about it. They didn't think that it was anything of importance. And I, having, when I moved to Santa Fe, one of the things that, um, one of the reasons I moved here was because of the sun and the beautiful sky that they had here. And I've been somebody who's always watched the sky. And the, the sky here was deep blue and beautiful, and it was something that gave me energy. It was just something that just elevated my spirit every time I saw it, no matter how bad my day was going. If I could get outside and see that beautiful sky and those big fluffy white clouds, I, everything was okay. And so I... Um, saw this being taken away, basically, and I didn't know what was going on, and I didn't, uh, I, I, I didn't know who was doing it or why it was doing or why it was being done, and I still don't know. But I do know, but what I do know is that it is being done, and it wasn't natural. The, the jets would come, and I know enough of, you know, I have a, I have a degree in science, I have a doctorate in science, so I consider myself to be maybe not a, an expert in, in, in this particular thing, but I know how to look at things, and I know that, you know, that if, if you pass natural sunlight through a substance and it gives off a color, it usually identifies that substance. There's no two substances that give the same color in solution. So I knew that I was looking at something that was other than water because that would have made uh, what we know as a rainbow. It would have pretty evenly distributed bands of color all along the, the spectrum. Well, I because because I was trying to convince people that it was actually happening and it wasn't normal, I began to try to see things that I could point out to the sky while I was with them to say, well, look at this. How do you explain this? And I learned a little bit about meteorology and, uh, can, you know, the atmospheric conditions necessary for even a, a, a contrail to form and persist, much less ones that just dissipate and, and, and found that there were no laws of physics that supported this activity, or the explanation of this activity as a normal water vapor or frozen vapor trail. And so I came up with things like, well, they're, you know, all of a sudden, you know, the jet goes overhead, and, 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 and in the same sky, you'll see two or three jets passing overhead, and there's nothing. You can barely see the jets because they're so high up. And other jets uh, come into an area, and, they, and all of a sudden, uh, the, the white trail starts all of a sudden coming out of the jet, and then it stops, and then it starts again. And I've seen a number of occasions where they just did dashes across the sky. And I stops and, and starts. I talked to a few pilots, and I asked them, well, how can you do this? And, and, and they, first of all, they did not believe that anything untoward was happening. And they said, well, you can turn your engine off. I said, would you do it over and over again? He says, if you're nuts, the sky's gone from uh, a deep blue to kind of a, a silvery white with a little hint of blue in it. Even on the best days, when, when you don't see a lot of activity overhead for even a week, um, it never comes close to the deep blue it used to be. And I started noticing, especially in, 90, in, in uh, by March of 99, April of 99, uh, people were becoming very, very ill. At the time, I was working in the healthcare facility, and I was seeing uh, a lot of upper respiratory disease happen. Uh, and over the years, I've watched more and more people come down with asthma. And you can hear it. You go to the supermarket and you find children, you know, children that are two and three years old, and, they're, and, and you can hear them wheezing. You can hear rails in their chest. I mean, this is very unusual. I, I, still, don't, I still really do not know why this is happening. I mean, I've gone the, the spectrum. I've gone the spectrum from thinking, oh, my God, they're trying to kill all of this, to uh, maybe they are trying to, you know, protect us from... Uh, cosmic radiation that may damage the planet, you know, ultra ultraviolet or x-ray radiation that's coming because the upper atmosphere has been uh, rented in some way, has been torn in such a way as to let those things through. So I've been on the way from, you know, the most evil intent to the most uh, beneficent. But in either either case, I want to know. I wanted to know, I, I just want to know, I want someone in an official capacity to speak about it openly. Because whenever whenever something happens, and, 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 and like I said, it's, 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 I've learned an awful lot about human beings through this process. Because I, I insist that this is happening, that this is real, and that it's not normal.
that, this, that there's something happening, there's something under the table going on that's not being talked about and yet it's happening in broad daylight, visibly. It's affecting everybody. It's uh, certainly, it, it, it's no longer the joy it used to be to go hiking in the mountains, to go outside to ride my bike. Um, I've had more upper respiratory and lower respiratory and sinus infections and, and health problems in the last five years than I have in all my life combined. And so that's part of my concern and also a lot of the people that I care about um, have been very ill. But in terms of are they going to stop it because the public is concerned? Well, the public is going to have to get really, really concerned in a very, very big way. And the thing that, I mean, now that's a cynical view. Uh, a paranoid view is that, um, well, if, if the public does have a big outcry against this, well, we already know they can, they can blatantly spray us with whatever the hell they please. And it could be, you know, they could, they could put, you know, put us to sleep or something, you know, they could, they could put something in, you know, some tranquilizers or something, we'd just be walking zombies. In a lot of ways, I think a lot of our population are walking zombies. I mean, the level, the, the, the lack of, the general lack of the ability to think critically about anything outside of one's own personal uh, life, safety, football games, is astounding to me. The hopeful view is that they, they're going to stop this at some point during my lifetime so that I can see blue skies again. And, and you know what? I've never ever had that feeling before until this started that there's actually one thing I want to see before I die. And that is a really deep blue sky. following is a transcribed interview between Clifford E. Carnicum and Gwyn Scott, naturopathic doctor and former CNN broadcaster, recorded in February of 2004. Question. When did you become aware? When did you find out? How did you find out about the existence of these operations and whether they are real or not? Response. Well, it's interesting, because I realized that if I had been any place else on the planet, I might not have noticed. And so I am wondering how I ended up in the catbird seat to actually observe this operation. Operations. As you know, I live in a very rural area, and when I first moved here, the air was pristine. We had deep, deep blue azure skies, thousands of stars literally at night probably one of the least polluted air supplies in this United States because New Mexico is a very rural state. Very few people, very little industry. It's one of the things that drew me here. So here I was sitting, reading in front of a five foot by five foot bay window one day, and I see these jets. I assume they're jets. They're high and they're going fast and they're not leaving the little inch, two inch things that I'm used to seeing. They're leaving those huge plumes through the sky that spread out. And by three or four in the afternoon, it's foggy. It's so thick I can't see the mountain range. I can't see anything. And it's been continuous and ongoing ever since. To the degree now that the skies are so degraded that we never see deep blue skies anymore. Stars at night are hard to find. Everybody is getting accustomed to the pale blue, often white skies that we live with but I see them going over and I've taken hundreds of photographs showing this is not your normal contrail that should dissipate. Question. You notice a distinct change then from the 1990 era? Response. Distinct is not the word. Dramatic, devastating, you can pick out any adjective you want. It is dramatically changed, the atmosphere. Dramatically, yes, extremely distinct question. You live on Native American Indian land here. What is the sense of and the reaction of the Native American community to what is occurring? Well, it's interesting. I figured if anybody would pick up on it, it would be the Native Americans. 
And so I immediately went to friends of mine in the community and said, have you guys noticed? And they are like, oh yes, we know absolutely what is going on. In fact, all 13 of the Pueblo governors had a meeting in secret to discuss it, what they would do, would they come out and protest it openly, what would they do? And after this meeting, they determined the following things. No, they would not, that it was just another dumb thing the white guy was doing, and at that point I don't think they understood the true significance. But now I think they do, but more importantly that people wouldn't believe them, or if they did believe them would think it was only happening in this very confined space, and it really didn't affect them, and they were concerned for the gaming that people wouldn't come to the casinos and things because they would think that just this area was experiencing it. So they voted unanimously to not say anything. Question. So even the Native American community did not show the level of independence or the level of assertiveness to make this an issue? Response. It was heartbreaking to me. But they're a little more philosophical too. One of the medicine people that's a friend said to me, you know, this has been prophesied. We call it the death winds. We always thought that it would be nuclear fallout. But maybe this is the death winds. They have a very skeptical view anyway of what the white man's intentions are. Comment. And with good cause. Response. And with good cause. And with history behind it. So, and they've also lost every battle, basically, they have fought that way. But I think as more and more of them get sick, and they are, there is maybe a wider awakening that this is really, really serious. Question. You have a background in the world of journalism, and specifically broadcast journalism. Can you talk a little bit about that background, and also the relationship of the media to what is occurring, what has failed, what has worked, any efforts that you have made to motivate the media to involve themselves in this, to cover this issue? Response. Yes, well, you and I are friends now, so you know that I was in broadcasting for 30 years. I worked for all three affiliated networks, ABC, NBC, CBS, in many of the larger markets, and I culminated my career as an anchor at CNN and Headline News. So the medicine part of me was kind of going along as my passion, and so I made my living and had my career as a broadcaster, and any free time I had was spent studying the medicine, because that was where my true heart lay. So I have over the years a lot of really good contacts in some pretty high places in the media. But I would imagine pretty much everybody watching this will know there has been dramatic changes in the media. Who owns the media? The quality of human now being attracted into the media. In other words, why are they there? When I started, it was mostly all print folk, and they kind of had to tell us, you know, come on, clean up your act. This is visual. But people were coming from the old school of journalistic, afflict the comfortable, and comfort the afflicted. And you are the watchdog. And you go for that story. And you never accept the official version. And on and on and on. Most of the media and information we get now is owned by only three companies. When they deregulated, the FCC deregulated, they allowed these huge, like AOL, Time Warner to gobble up. So you've got these large entities controlling all the information, whether it's film, radio, okay. So the complexion has changed, and I would say the kind of person drawn into it when it became a place where you could make a really good living, and people would go, oh, I know you, you're so-and-so, it drew people with different agendas. So you don't necessarily have the hardcore, old-fashioned, get the story. I don't care if my hair is a mess. I don't care if I'm dripping wet. There's a few out there still, but for the most part. So that's that. And yes, when this started, I called in every chip I ever had. I called a very good buddy at CNN who really assigned most of the stories. He was very high, very interested. I sent him your website, a lot of your information. He was high, high, yay, yay, shut down and I never did get an explanation. As you well know, I contacted some of our local media people. The main anchor on the local station wanted to do a story, we thought, and we shot a lot of video of the activity. In those days, it was very obvious. Now it's a little harder. 
You don't have the mornings where you have the deep blue sky and then the afternoon. You get the pale blue white sky if you're lucky. And as you well know, that story never aired. Comment. I would consider that a fairly serious dedicated effort by a media person, and yet we saw nothing come of it. Response. Nothing came of it. Exactly. As you well know, the USA Today, which is an international publication, did a story on it. But it was obviously with an agenda, basically poking fun at those goofy, goofy people who saw those things. I believe there was one or two credible people interviewed, but for the most part, the reporter started out with an agenda to sort of mock, make fun of those people who were seeing things in the sky. And if I had a dime for everybody else that they called, wrote, or begged, I could at least buy an ice cream cone, to no avail, just hitting a wall. Comment. And this was with all your connections. Response. This is with years of connections. It's unprecedented in my life. And I cannot name another story. People point to Watergate as this big watershed cover-up. I find that laughable. This, in my opinion, is the biggest story. And I approached many of my colleagues this way. This is the biggest story in recorded human history. You have an entire planet now covered with whatever by whoever and nobody's even acknowledging it. What the heck is going on, and how come we don't know? Question. That's the question. What could explain that level of refusal? Response. A few things, okay. A few things, to be fair. Fear. I saw that. Fear. Because the folks that get it know who's doing it, and they're afraid. Okay? They know it's something bigger than them. They know all the possibilities of who is able to put planes in the sky, that many, every day, 24-7. It doesn't take a nuclear physicist to figure out that it's not the guy around the corner. This is big. Comment. So even the journalist has that threshold that they're unwilling to cross. Response. Oh yeah. Afraid. And the few that are left who do catch on to it and say, wow, I want to do this story, like we were just discussing. They hit a wall somewhere, and I'm never told where it is. I don't know if it's the news director. I don't know if it's the station manager. I don't know who. But they hit that brick wall, and it goes away. pilot for um, uh, over 40 years I've been flying. I stopped counting my hours at 3,500 hours, which is a fair amount. I've owned seven airplanes in my life. I have ratings all the way up to uh, twin IFR. I, I am not jet rated, but, you know, everything else. But today, Clifford, when, when all of a sudden you, you see these trails in the sky in the morning when you wake up, and by late morning, early afternoon, the sky is totally overcast. It is not natural. The government and, and other people say, oh, well, that's, that's a contrail, condensation, contrail, that, that all planes do at a certain altitude. And I said, you don't know what you're talking about. Yes, there are contrails. Go back to World War II, we had contrails but they didn't last. This was, you know, in those days it was condensation of moisture and then it dissipates after, I don't know, maybe maybe depending on the altitude, maybe a minute, maybe a little over a minute, but around a minute and, and, and it's gone. These things last all day long unless there's a strong wind and it blows out of the way. Now it's gotten so bad and I talk to people, as you know, all over the world and it's happening almost every country that I'm aware of in the world. We have listeners in at least 50 countries that we know of. And, and people are always reporting back. If, if we get into a discussion or times that, that you have been on the show before, 
uh, people come back and, and just report incredible experiences. Um, they have a lot of respiratory problems. They never had that before. People are having a lot of sinus problems. They've never had that before. And it's always after they have been inundated with some of these sprays. Um, you also asked about, you know, how do people feel about it? Uh, they are extremely concerned because there seems to be something that is happening that is affecting them physically and in some cases even emotionally and psychologically. So there, there is a drastic change in what is happening around us in what, five years, five and a half years? And people have never seen this or experienced this before. Clifford, it's so good to be on tape in person uh, with you on this subject. I know um, before we couldn't show my face, we couldn't hear my voice because I was under contractual agreement. I'm no lo longer under that contractual agreement. So I can be here in person and that feels good. And I thank you so much for translating uh, my prior uh, discussion with you on the media and all of that. But today what I'd really like to talk about is the medicine end, which is my passion and my whole uh, reason for being involved in this is to try to help people stay as well as they can stay given the givens. I also want to say something that's very important to my heart is that I am deeply patriotic. That's all I really want to say. Never thought I'd live to be seeing these times. Um, as you know, recently information was brought to us that's critical uh, in terms of health. So I want to deal with that first. And then we can go back and talk about the other contents of this aerosol spray and the impact of the body and perhaps some mitigating medicines. We have found out through a very credentialed research doctor that perhaps what we're seeing um, occasionally show up in our air supply is a fungus. The reason this is so critical is apparently this fungus um, dramatically compromises the immune system by consuming those nutrients the immune system uses to repair and rebuild. And um, like every system in our body, the immune system has to keep rebuilding itself. Um, it will wear out, it will wear down, and it has to keep regenerating. If it doesn't have those nutritional tools to do that, your immune system becomes dramatically compromised, unable to deal with any kind of invader. That's why I think we're seeing so many more colds and flus than we've seen in the last five and a half, six years, than we've seen in a long time. I know uh, in my clients, these things are, are like epidemic. Uh, sinus infections, colds and flus. That's on the lighter side. On the, on the heavier side, we're seeing a lot more cancers and some very devastating disease implying an extremely compromised immune system. Um, part of that has to be this fungal kind of invasion because, as I said, this fungus eats the nutrients that the immune system uses to rebuild itself. People say, well, what do you do about a fungus? Well, there's some things that we know that are very good natural medicines for fungal um, invasions like that. Garlic kills fungus pretty much on contact. Uh, the Chinese mushrooms, reishi, shiitake, maitake, particularly in extract form, have been very, um, had a lot of efficacy. Caprylic acid, which you can find in any health food store. There are a number of things, and finally colloidal silver, we know. Uh, is a, a major antifungal. So when people are looking at their bodies and saying, why am I always feeling kind of run down and tired? It may be uh, we're being told now that this person is looking at the blood of many, many people, and in almost everyone, this fungus shows up in their bloodstream. So that's something we can take care of. If, if it becomes a, something in the lungs, we can do the tea tree oil inhales. We also know that we're getting a lot of particulate heavy metals, all of which not good for the body. Uh, and I'd like to just quick run through them, their potential uh, damage to the body, but then also some mitigating medicines we can do. We know that there's some aluminum in this, uh, and we also know that aluminum, unfortunately, can cross the blood-brain barrier. And we know through research it's been correlated to diseases like Alzheimer's. Uh, if not so extreme, certainly short-term memory loss. Uh, 
So sad to say the blood-brain barrier does not recognize aluminum as a toxin and lets it go through into the brain. The good news is if you have enough what are called essential fatty acids in your system, your brain has the ability to take that metal, aluminum, and push it out of the brain into your hair. And I think that's why uh, so many people who are getting hair analysis are seeing high, high concentrates of aluminum in their hair. It's the brain doing its job trying to get this toxin out. Some good essential fatty acids that you can consider are flaxseed oil, uh, evening primrose oil, and most recently brought to me very profound is krill, K-R-I-L-L -L oil. It's a fish oil that's fairly pure. These essential fatty acids allow the brain to get rid of that aluminum. We also know that barium is part of the mix. And barium, besides being a carcinogenic, uh, knocks pretty much all the potassium out of your body. And we've seen, we're seeing, I'm seeing in my clients, a lot of muscle weakness, uh, a lot of heart palpitations, all related to um, a, a, either a complete loss of potassium or too, way too low level of potassium. So we know since we're bringing barium in and it's knocking the potassium out, we need to supplement more potassium in. And I would say uh, for anybody who's listening to me, the responsible thing would be to say, um, to share whatever you decide to do with your health care practitioner because if you're on certain medications, um, it can contraindicate. But these are just general guidelines and information for people not prescription, not diagnostic. Yeah. There is also apparently some titanium in this mix from your research. Uh, again, another heavy metal. And magnesium. And for a long time, I could not <clears throat> understand why that would be a bad thing because we're always encouraging people you know, to take some magnesium in. However, my brother, who's a physicist, accidentally gave me uh, an answer that I had been seeking two or three years why I was seeing so many blood clots and thick, sticky blood platelets. And it's epidemic now and constantly running commercials for blood thinners and on and on. Well, he tells me when you combine an aluminum ion with a magnesium ion, it clots the blood. So we have both of those in this mix. Um, my personal choice is ginger root for blood thinning. I take ginger root capsules every day. There's also an herb called ginkgo biloba that also thins the blood. But I would, this is a very important cautionary. If anybody is on a pharmaceutical blood thinner, do not, do not add in any of these other remedies because you can get your blood so thin that if you cut yourself, your blood won't clot. So it's dangerous. So if you're on any pharmaceutical blood thinner, not, do not add in ginger root and ginkgo biloba and those kinds of things. But if you're not on a pharmaceutical, these are good natural things you may want to consider in terms of thinning the blood. And then there are some, I get this question all the time, people say, well, what can we do you know, to mitigate some of this? I mean, it's in every, every breath I take. That's something I think is hard for people to understand. This is not something previously I could say to people. Uh, please don't eat margarine. Please don't drink tap water. These things are not good for you. I cannot ask people not to breathe. But what I can say, there are things that you can do to mitigate the amounts of it that you're taking in. One thing that you, you well know I do is when I'm outdoors, I wear a mask. It's not comfortable. It looks silly. I get stares. But I have to tell you, since I've been doing that, I've noticed a big improvement in what kind of symptomology I've had to deal with. Also, there is something, a very good all-natural substance called diatomaceous clay that has the unique property of, of attracting heavy metals to it then binding with them and allowing your body to then send it out through your bowel. In most health food stores, you can find it under the name of bentonite. You have to make sure, though, this diatomaceous clay that you're taking in is food grade uh, because they do have diatomaceous clay at the, um, at the, at the nurseries, and, and that's not pure. But if you go to your health store or if you know somebody who has food grade diatomaceous clay, that is something I do daily to try to begin to remove these metals because all heavy metals are detrimental to the system. Again, 
um, flaxseed oil, krill oil, uh, the omega-369 oils, very important, particularly for brain function during these times. Potassium supplementation. And another epidemic is sinus infections and that colloidal silver nasal spray I use and I've had a lot of friends use it and it's very effective with helping to clean up those sinus infections caused, I'm sure, by all these particulates. I don't know if you know, um, one of the top respiratory specialists in the United States was recently on the Today Show. Uh, he's written a book called um, something about the breathing crisis in this country. And he told, I think it was Katie Kirk, I don't recall who was interviewing him, maybe Ann Curry, um, that death or mortality from respiratory disease had gone from number eight five years ago to almost number three. That's huge. That means that the third le leading cause of death now in this country is breathing. And one has to wonder what could have happened in five years to have created that kind of crisis is the only word I can think of. So this is something that anybody who breathes, and I'm assuming that's anybody who might be seeing this documentary, needs to be concerned not only for themselves but everyone they love. This isn't like a firing squad where everybody goes down and you get to watch it at one time. This is a cumulative poisoning that will demonstrate in different people in different manners depending on how strong their immune system was to begin with, um, what their genetics are and many other factors. So this is something that will demonstrate in a lot of different ways. You're not going to have, as I said, the firing squad effect. But what you will have is over time more and more debilitated people, more and more people who don't feel well, more and more younger people, which I'm seeing quite a bit of now in their 20s, 30s, and 40s with problems that we never saw in that age range, or rarely, I should say, saw. When this began five and a half, almost six years ago, 24-7, we know that maybe it's been going on however long, but the 24-7 heavy spraying uh, during that time, at the beginning I saw mostly older, frail people and, and infants suffering and leaving the planet. Um, but now it's, it's coming down the old chronological scale here. So we're dealing with people, um, teenagers, 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s, um, with a lot of debilitating problems. And I know in Albuquerque alone, uh, five, six years ago, six to eight percent of the children were diagnosed as asthmatic. Today, as of now, it's 70 percent. It's devastating. These are children. I would say to anybody listening, one of the first and most important things that you can do is start to eat your medicine. Get rid of the junk food, get rid of the empty food, get rid of the zapped food, and begin to eat, uh, if you can, organic and free range. If you can, at least good, whole, pure food. Don't zap it in the microwave. That removes all the good digestive enzymes and many of the nutrients. So start with your diet, because your body is, is uh, under an insult that it's probably never in the history of man, I don't think seen before and in order for you to stay healthy and those that you love you've got to really begin to pay attention to what you're eating the water that you're drinking that's the first line of defense I'd also encourage people to consider a good all natural vitamin and mineral supplementation program because again um, our bodies need every bit of help we can give them in these times you know it's Clifford's interesting um, one of the most frequently asked questions for those who are conscious and aware of this aerosol operation is do they is this intended to harm us and <clears throat> I can't answer that I don't know but what I can say is do they know that it's harming us it, it, unequivocally they do at this point in time and so one uh, who lives in a free and democratic country would want to wonder why would the people that we trust to care for us, keep us safe, allow this kind of thing to go on. I personally um, have gone way deep inside and had many sleepless nights 
and can't come up with any plausible reason why you could, for any reason, harm so many people um, in such a dramatic way. And so I would say, if you are like me, you love this country, you're deeply patriotic, that take advantage of, of, of that freedom that we are given here in this beautiful land of democracy. Make your voice heard. Ask for an explanation. Ask for a discussion. So that we can determine if this is something we want in our air supply. We can't just keep ignoring it. It's not going to go away. It's just not going to go away unless people of consciousness and conscience decide to get up off the couch and do something. And they can decide what that something is. Because if they don't, as they watch the people around them and they look at their own health and they see the deterioration, they're going to have to wonder at some point, well, gosh, why didn't I do something? when I could. the reality of the changes that have been made to the planet, it is a natural question to ask, why? Why would anyone want to? And who would want to alter the very air that we all breathe? We may never know the true answers to these questions, as the evidence is now clear that the aerosol operations are a covert operation, an operation that is never to be openly discussed or disclosed using the traditional channels of a free and democratic society, an operation that will never ask for your consent or for your participation and that will be conducted regardless of your concern. The answers, especially as to why, do not appear to be simple or restricted to a single purpose. The more that is understood about the nature and potential of the operations, the more complex the picture appears. What can be done, however, is to use the vast body of evidence that has been collected at a grassroots level to make interpretations that are at least consistent with this data. This has been done, and there are now five major areas of endeavor that are in agreement with the observations, data, and analysis that extends for more than five years. These are, number one, environmental engineering, modification, and control. Two, electromagnetic operations. 3. Military operations, 4. Biological operations, and 5. Planetary and geophysical change itself. These areas are not mutually exclusive to one another. There is an overlap that can make it difficult to discern where one program may start and another end. It is quite possible that any, and indeed likely, that many or all of these operations are being conducted concurrently. What can be done within this brief segment is to explain how and why these types of programs are consistent with the broad spectrum of evidence that is now available to examine. First, with respect to environmental engineering, modification, and control, the evidence now shows that the very physical nature of the atmosphere has been changed. The best information leads to the conclusion that a hygroscopic or water-seeking salt is a dominant component of the aerosols that have been introduced. It is also an observation that has been confirmed over and over, and this is that the operations frequently, if not usually, are conducted in advance of approaching moisture and storms. These salts have the usual effect of locking up that moisture with the solid particles, and to generally reduce the impact of, frequency of, and the amount of moisture that reaches the ground. This is one of the simplest interpretations that can be made that is supported by countless observations, and this is that the moisture levels of weather systems have been altered. 
It may be no coincidence whatsoever that drought is now commonplace and widespread, and that the moisture of the planet is becoming an increasingly precious and sought-after resource. There are those who make claims that the aerosol operations have an intended benevolent objective to mitigate the effects of global warming. It is also apparently accepted within that same claim that it is best that such an intention not be internationally discussed in public and that you are best off not knowing about it. Unfortunately, the data does not support the contentions of benevolence that have been made, and in fact the majority of the data can be considered to have detrimental and potentially disastrous consequences to the life and ecology of this planet, including humans. Furthermore, the vast majority of elements and substances under examination will actually increase the heat levels of the lower atmosphere, rather than decrease it, when they are placed into it. This is exactly what the observations themselves support, and that is that drought conditions are exacerbated and aggravated by the introduction of the aerosols and not mitigated, as many might choose to believe. In addition, there are many more complicated aspects of environmental control that are possible with the use of conductive aerosols, including the modification of the electrical nature of the atmosphere as well as thermal instabilities induced by interactions with the magnetic field of the Earth. Storms depend upon the electrical exchanges that take place within the atmosphere. Lightning is the result of electrical imbalances that occur in the electrical fields between the Earth and the atmosphere, altering the collection and distribution of rainfall, interfering with the electrical exchange of energy and producing thermal or heat instabilities, all of these point to a very realistic assessment that environmental modification and control is likely a fundamental agenda within the aerosol operations. The United States Air Force has publicly disclosed a doctrine of owning the weather by 2025, and many have good reason to believe that such objectives have in part already been accomplished. This brief introduction to this topic only considers impacts upon the atmospheric shell literally an eggshell of life that surrounds this planet. Understanding the full environmental impact, including the soil, the seas and lakes, the flora and fauna, the agriculture that sustains us, can only lead to an ominous portent of environmental change that we must pay the price for with our apathy. Not only are the moisture and heat characteristics of the atmosphere altered with the introduction of aerosols, but the electromagnetic properties have likely been changed as well. An ion is a charged electrical particle, and all of the data supports the claim that massive amounts of easily ionized particles are another important part of the grand geophysical picture. There are some elements that can actually become charged with the energy from ultraviolet light and even visible light in some cases. Barium is one such element that falls into this category. The implications of being able to modify the atmosphere electrically and magnetically are enormous, and a variety of physical methods that are used to transfer, manipulate, control, and propagate energy in that medium must then be considered. As an example of how a small change can produce a major effect, Consider the following statement from Lancaster University in the United Kingdom on the topic of the ionosphere. Quote, Although less than 1% of the upper atmosphere becomes ionized, the charged particles make the gas electrically conducting, which completely changes its characteristics. The ionosphere can carry electrical currents as well as reflect, deflect, and scatter radio waves. Unquote. What we see, therefore, is that a small change in the electrical properties of the atmosphere, be it the upper or now lower atmosphere, completely alters the way in which that shell around the Earth can be used. This concept introduces us to the topic of plasma physics, which may be more in the grasp of common understanding than might first be believed. Most of us are familiar with a neon or fluorescent light tube. This is a perfectly common example of what plasma physics is about. In that tube, there is an ionized gas, 
and energy can easily be sent through that tube to produce the effect of light in that case. A plasma is an electrically conductive gas. This means that there is a source of ions and electrons within that gas, and that these electrons can be used to carry current. We have seen that it takes very little change to produce a large change in the electrical properties of that gas, and the effectiveness of energy transfer and accumulation is governed primarily by the number of electrons that can be introduced into it. The term that describes this is electron density, and it becomes increasingly important in our understanding of the likely goals of the aerosol operations. Multiple measurements of atmospheric conductivity levels, extremely low frequency and very low frequency radiation, as well as magnetic variation, support the claims made that the basic electrical properties of our atmosphere have been changed. These two physical properties alone that have been mentioned, that of thermodynamic and electrodynamic change, have the prospect of changing our world so much that even the most conservative of environmentally aware individuals should be aware of the prospect for disturbance and damage. Changes in heat and energy are at the foundation of the life of this planet and all those who dwell upon it. It is a necessary, logical, and natural extension to our discussion of applications to include the almost inevitable role the military assumes within them. Indeed, the dichotomy of extreme, sustained, and continuous interest and monitoring of the aerosol research by the military and intelligence complex, juxtaposed with the public declaration by the U.S. Air Force that this entire subject is a hoax, is curious enough that many of us may wish to seek the truth of the matter. The most advanced military agencies, intelligence services, and defense contractors clearly have an interest in monitoring and controlling the level of discussion and disclosure on the aerosol issue. The tools of research and analysis must therefore be used at least in part to compensate for the lack of openness that now shrouds this democracy under the guise of national security. A glimpse into the military window has been achieved, and a central theme will eventually emerge, and that is of control. Control in the deepest and far-reaching sense that you may imagine. For when the atmosphere of the planet is controlled, life itself, in the end, is controlled. With a basic knowledge of plasma physics, that is, the physics of an energized gas or atmosphere, it is impossible to proceed further without at least a brief introduction to the HARP facility and technology. HARP, or High Active Auroral Research Program, is operated by the U.S. Air Force and is claimed to be simply a research facility. The stated purpose by the Air Force for the HARP project is that of a scientific endeavor aimed at studying the properties and behavior of the ionosphere, with particular emphasis on being able to understand and use it to enhance communications and surveillance systems for both civilian and defense purposes. It may be this, and then again, it may be more than simply a scientific endeavor. It may also be enlightening to consider United States Patent 4686-605 by Bernard Eastland in 1987 entitled, A Method and Apparatus for Altering a Region in the Earth's Atmosphere, Ionosphere, and or Magnetosphere. There are many who have sensibly concluded that this patent essentially represents a blueprint for the HARP facility as it has been constructed. This patent makes mention of numerous objectives and methods of operation that far exceed any scientific endeavor alone, and references the work of Nikola Tesla as a source of historical contribution. The amazing inventions and achievements of Tesla with respect to energy transfer and amplification, including the use of the atmosphere as a medium for sending energy from point A to point B, are well documented. The documents of Tesla were eventually confiscated at the close of his life, especially as they related to military matters, and he is generally now accepted as an unrecognized genius.
The current incarnation of ionospheric heating is able to, according to Mr. Eastland, put unprecedented amounts of power in the Earth's atmosphere at strategic locations and to maintain that power level with the pulsing of energy. This patent also recommends the use of large clouds of barium so that ionization by sunlight will increase the electron density within the plasma environment. Testing and analysis does now positively indicate the presence of unusual levels of barium, a toxic element, within atmospheric samples. The amount of power inherent in the design of the HARP project is further indicated by Mr. Eastland stating that the present invention can be formed to simulate or perform the same functions as a detonation of a heave-type nuclear device without actually having to detonate such a device. A heave weapon has the effect of lifting the magnetic field of the Earth itself and involves the expenditure of massive amounts of energy. The patent is further stated to have numerous military implications, including the enhancement of or interference with communication and guidance systems, including those of airplanes and missiles, radar interference, missile destruction, weather modification, material transport of micron-sized particles, and molecular change of the atmosphere are each mentioned as further applications of the patent design. The executive summary for the HARP project also specifically mentions forcing the descent of particles from the atmosphere toward the ground using ELF radiation from HARP. Clearly, environmental modifications, the electromagnetic transfer of energy, and military operations of global impact are already in sight from the existence of these aerosols within our atmosphere. In 1977, the United States Senate held hearings on the subject of biological testing by the Department of Defense on human subjects without their informed consent. In the opening statement, Senator Kennedy identifies the key issue of the hearings, the known use of Americans as unwitting human subjects for open-air germ warfare testing conducted in the public domain by officials of our own government. Furthermore, he poses the critical question, should a democratic people cede to its government the full responsibility of determining when secret tests on unwitting subjects are necessary to protect the nation's security? It appears that this key issue was never truly addressed, and that, almost 30 years later, this responsibility is no longer a question that is even being posed to the public. It is a fact, however unpleasant and distressing the consideration may be, that biological components have been repeatedly identified in a series of tests of atmospheric samples over a period of several years. The U.S. Environmental Protection Agency has refused to identify physical material that has been demonstrated to contain biologicals of this same form. These components appear to involve the use of desiccation, freeze-drying, and aerosol distribution methods, exactly the same methods itemized within the private contractor listings of the Senate hearings. Evidence further indicates that extremely advanced biotechnical methods are likely to be a part of the development and delivery process. To date, no professional or public medical professionals have attempted to duplicate the test methods and results, and the evidence continues to be provided only through independent citizen activism. Acknowledgement and response to this evidence by all public officials remains lacking. There is currently no prospect of government hearings on the aerosol issue, and the reality of the evidence continues to be denied by public officials. And lastly, although more conceptual in nature than our earlier discussion on environmental modification, electromagnetic, military, and biological aspects of the aerosol issue, it is not unreasonable to consider interactions with the Earth as a whole it is not impossible that there may be connections between the energy levels of this altered plasma of the Earth and geophysical processes, including Earth changes. There has been increased attention in recent months by prestigious scientific organizations, mainstream media, and the Defense Department itself on dramatic Earth changes that are foreseen in the not-too-distant future. 
These discussions center on major climatic change and geophysical field changes, such as the magnetic field. Under disclosure is the likelihood that these changes occur much more rapidly than was previously supposed. It is at least a theoretical reality that a plasma sheath around the Earth can accumulate energy. This originates from the combination of increased electron density and low frequency energy propagation. There are many questions that can be asked as to how and if this energy can be harnessed to affect the Earth. The many abnormal Earth changes already on the record during the recent years certainly offer a motive for examining the energy transfer between the Earth and the now altered atmosphere. You have seen traces of a world still in a state of beauty, and you have seen the signs of a terrible change. It will be for you to decide if the claims of this documentary are true or not. You have seen the distinctions between what mankind has known for decades to be in harmony with our surroundings and that which is a product of our urge for technological supremacy over nature. You have seen a clear sky, this blue that was but is no more the sky that has been taken away from us all. You have been confronted with assertions of operations on a scale never seen before in the history of mankind, and you have been shown evidence that aircraft can alter and have altered the fragile envelope for life that we call the atmosphere. You have seen science and sampling applied to the problem over and over at the grassroots level. Numerous methods have been demonstrated that show artificial and deliberate modification of the atmosphere, including its chemical, thermal, electromagnetic, and physical properties. There are detrimental effects that can be anticipated and that have been observed as a result of these changes in our air, and we must all accept the consequences of the toxic environment that has been created. The health of our home and lives have been sacrificed in the search for dominion and control. You have witnessed a high level of interest in the subject of this documentary by the military branches at the highest level, the intelligence services, the chemical industry, research organizations, defense contractors, bioengineering firms, and the pharmaceutical complex. You have heard the responses of the public, government, and even environmental organizations in response to the innumerable requests by the public for investigation. These responses repeatedly revert to describing phenomena that are normal and commonly observed, while denying and dismissing the extraordinary observations that sensible and reasonable citizens have called attention to. There has been a sustained campaign to ridicule and discredit the cumulative efforts of years of research, activism, and devotion by countless individuals acting from the motive of concern for the health of this planet and its inhabitants. A free and democratic society, if it is to continue to exist, must be able to openly discuss the benefits of technological and military supremacy against the deleterious impact upon the environment that we as global citizens must share. Divine rights of humankind must assume their rightful place amongst the individual nation's right for military security and secrecy. You have heard the responses of only a few citizens and professionals who state their sensible concerns about the impact of the aerosol operations upon our environment and our health. The lack of time prevents the presentation of the awareness that is now known to be shared by a grassroots network that conservatively must include millions of people. The extent of this awareness across national boundaries is apparent and this network is of global proportion. The control of media information by relatively few corporate interests appears to be a significant factor in the restriction of honest and open public discourse on the aerosol issue. The attempts at ridicule of this issue by the U.S. military establishment should also be evaluated as to intent and motive. You have been provided with an analysis of the potential agendas of the aerosol operations, the conduct of environmental, military, electromagnetic, 
biological and geophysical operations are each consistent with the vast body of information and evidence that has been accumulated over a period of more than five years. This result has been reached with the painstaking efforts of numerous citizens, researchers and activists across the country and around the globe. Many of the operations under consideration would appear to regard the welfare of human beings, the life of this planet, and our environment as a low priority. Many people, having become convinced of the reality of these operations, will naturally ask the question, what can I do to help? It is also known from experience in history that many of these same individuals feel helpless and powerless after they confront the immensity and complexity of the operations. They also often become disillusioned after encountering the predictable and disingenuous responses of our public servants. It is also known that the traditional methods of dissent and activism are no longer working and the political process is failing in a constitutional sense. Petitions have been signed and disregarded. Appeals for investigation are dismissed. Calls for media involvement lead to crafted articles of ridicule. Even the legitimacy of the voting process itself is in question. There is no comfortable, reassuring, and simple answer that can be given to you. This is the reality that we must face. It is expected that any success will eventually result from an enormous groundswell of grassroots activism and open public protest. At the current rate of progress, a timeline of decades can be projected before we reach the level of influence that is needed. The sober counter-reality is that the health of this planet is not likely to give us such a generous allowance of time. Our atmosphere is our lifeblood, and like the proverbial frog in the warming pot of water, we are acting obliviously to our own demise. You will have to use your talents and resources, your gift of life, to help this planet. The role of this researcher has been to give you the best information of what is believed to be the true nature of the aerosol operations. You will have to determine your role and exercise that role while you still have the opportunity to do so. If you are a professional, you must inquire into the ethics of your profession and answer the questions of public service that accompany it. If you are a citizen, you must participate. If you remain silent in the hope of preserving your freedom and security, you are almost certain to lose both. The doctor, the journalist, the scientist, the lawyer, the politician, the environmentalist, the activist, the author, the filmmaker, the fundraiser, the organizer. You must all assume your roles openly, publicly, and quickly to offer any real hope for our survival. I make this appeal to you. This documentary is a not-for-profit venture. It has been made with an appeal to you personally in mind. It may be freely copied in its entirety and distributed. No individual is permitted to distribute this documentary with a profit motive. It has been created for the benefit of the public. Please help us to restore and regain the world that you know can exist. <laughs>